Hello BNG 426-526 class. Um, this is the pre-lecture for yet another flip classroom activity. Uh, this one a bit of a departure on what we've been talking about uh, recently. As you know we've been talking about uh, metabolic control analysis. Uh, this is a more general topic and a more general idea uh, of what um, metabolic engineering can be used uh, to do. Uh, we'll talk about carbon fixation uh, among microbes, uh, biofuels production, and the metabolic fluxes involved therein. Uh, so essentially, uh, the dream of biofuels started as a way to uh, kind of provide an alternative energy source, um, because depending on who you ask, um, the conventional fuels petroleum, coal, coal uh, oil, things like that. Um, they are certainly finite. We don't know how finite, but uh, they are also um, can produce pollutants when burned and things like that. Whereas biofuels could theoretically be uh, sustainable in that we can continue to renewably produce them by fermentation or other means. Uh, they tend to be cleaner burning um, they could very well be efficient in terms of the amount of bang for the buck. Um, and I think most of all, the ability to produce a process that creates and refines biofuels is championing uh, innovation. And that's what we are all about, uh, is coming up with innovations to um, provide that next big breakthrough. So. Research on biofuels in the past 20 or 30 years has expanded exponentially. Um, to be able to provide sustainable bio-based energy source um, requires, like I say, innovation. It requires advances to be made. Um, and people have done a lot of these innovations with different processes that create different biofuel molecules. And there are many biofuel molecules that can be, uh, can be created here. Um, there can be long-chain lipid-based biofuels, there can be alcohols, um, there can even be methane and propane and things like that, uh, as well as the obvious biofuels. Wood itself is a biofuel, um, even though we may not think of it as such, but it's the oldest biofuel in the world. Um, but processes to make biofuel molecules, individual molecules like alcohols, like esters of um, lipids and fatty acids and things like that. Um, in order to have a viable process that creates these things, they must be high yield, so that means the organisms involved must produce a lot of the stuff. They must do it really cheaply. Um, since we are burning the stuff, it's not a commodity compound that's going to stick around. Um, it is going to take the place of petroleum, which, you know, if you've been to the pump lately, it's around $3 a gallon. Um, and it's got to be high volume. So it's got to be all these three things in order to even have a chance to compete with petroleum fuels, petroleum-based fuels. Uh, metabolic engineering can play a role in at least two of the above three things. Cheap feedstocks, you could maybe even argue, could also uh, be um, enhanced via metabolic engineering. But at least the high yield and the high volume aspect of the biofuel producing organism can be tackled using uh, our metabolic engineering capabilities. And there are many biocatalysts we can use uh, for making biofuels. Uh, I talk at length about Rhodococcus opacus. They make triacylglycerols that can be converted to biodiesel. Zymomonas mobilis, as you know, is a bacterium that produces ethanol. Clostridium species grow anaerobically and they produce higher alcohols like butanol. Uh, they also produce a little ethanol, a little acetone. Yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, well known for ethanol production. Pickia pastoris, Yarrowia lip lipolytica, both of those produce lipids that can, like uh, the lipids of Rhodococcus opacus, be converted to uh, fatty acid esters that are biodiesel. 
algae uh, can be used to make uh, ethanol, they can be engineered to make butanol, uh, and they can also produce um, lipids that again can be turned into biodiesel. Plants uh, also, as, as I said before, wood is the oldest biofuel, uh, but things like soybean oil and palm oil uh, can be used again to make biodiesel. Biodiesel is a common thing. But then you get into, with soybean and oil palm anyway, you get into the what is known as the food versus fuel controversy, where we're, we are taking crops um, that are used for their food production uh, and using them to put in our gas tanks. And some, some folks uh, would rather not do that. Um, but then there's also things like animal fats. So when we take animals and prepare them to be eaten, uh, there are wastes, and a lot of that waste can be fat. And we can collect that fat, process it in such a way that we end up getting um, purified, more purified animal fat that can be then turned into uh, biodiesel. So there are many avenues we can explore in which we can um, make a biodiesel, which we can use different biocatalysts. And some of these, for um, depending on the organism, are innate pathways, like for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, for um, Zymomonas mobilis, they have innate ethanol production pathways. Um, butanol, Clostridium acetobutylicum, has an innate biobutanol production pathway. Um, but a lot of organisms like E. coli, Carinobacterium, uh, and others can be used to import biofuel synthesis so pathways. So they can be um, microbial chassis that can be used to make a new biofuel production organism. And there are many pathways by which we can kind of open the hood and create a biofuel production organism out of a non-production organism say like E. coli here. E. coli uses a fair amount of uh, diverse amount of sugars, um, glycerol, acetate, protein, etc. Um, and we can kind of uh, convert some of that carbon that E. coli is taking in to produce biofuel molecules, to produce um, these carbon-rich biofuel molecules. So there are many pathways. Of course, we have well established the ethanol production pathway from um, Saccharomyces, but also things like um, methanol, higher alcohols, uh, fatty acids, biodiesel, even things like biohydrogen and, and um, alkanes and alkenes can be produced if we put the right genes in a uh, microbial chassis. So there are many pathways, many metabolites, and many options. Uh, and we can maximize productivity of a natural pathway, i.e. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or introduce a heterologous pathway, like with E. coli, and any biofuel pathway we would put into E. coli, in order to make a organism that can create fuels for us. One thing that has been um, examined recently, uh, in the last 10 years or so, uh, is carbon fixation. Um, so what I had said before, where we are looking for cheap carbon sources, well, carbon dioxide is plentiful um, in the atmosphere. It's getting more plentiful. Um, it is readily available. Uh, we just have to kind of capture it from the air, and uh, we can capture it from uh, the exhausts of uh, power plants and factories and things like that. And potentially we can use that, we can convert it into um, other compounds. Trees do this, plants do this all the time. They convert carbon dioxide to carbohydrates, starches, um, cellulose, and oxygen and water. Um, they do this via photosynthesis. Um, so that's essentially carbon fixation, is photosynthesis. It's just the process of capturing carbon dioxide and assimilating it into biological molecules. We can do the same thing if we pick the right organism and use carbon dioxide 
to be assimilated into a biofuel compound. So carbon fixation, like I said, CO2, carbon dioxide is a carbon source. Uh, there are two other necessary compounds that are needed for um, carbon fixation. There's got to be an energy source for plants, for algae, it's sunlight. For bacteria and other autotrophic organisms, um, it's hydrogen that's used as the uh, energy source. And there's got to be some kind of electron acceptor. Um, and that usually, for autotrophic bacteria anyway, takes the form of oxygen. I think also for plants and algae, it takes the form of oxygen. And basically, the organism makes water out of the hydrogen and oxygen after they've gotten the energy out of it. Uh, and several different types of carbon fixation cycles have been identified. And of course, the one overarching um, similarity here is that they're all carbon fixation. They're all using in some way, they're incorporating carbon dioxide into um, compounds that are um, used for cell growth. The most famous carbon fixation pathway of them all is the Car Calvin Benson Basham cycle, often shortened to the Calvin cycle. But we don't want to forget about Benson and Basham here. Um, they helped define this cycle here where carbon dioxide is used uh, and assimilated into glycerate 3 phosphate um, by this enzyme called Rubisco. Um, and this is a well known carbon fixation enzyme. Um, it is called the ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. Um, you can see what it does. It will convert carbon dioxide plus ribulose bisphosphate into glycerate 3 phosphate. And you can see the stoichiometry here. We've got three molecules of ribulose bisphosphate, three molecules of carbon dioxide, yielding us six molecules of glycerate 3 phosphate. Uh, and Rubisco, while it's the most common, it's the most well understood carbon fixation cycle there is, um, Rubisco leaves something to be desired in that it can also use oxygen as a um, substrate. In fact, oxygen will outcompete carbon dioxide, so it's not the most ideal um, pathway to use, but a lot of organisms have this pathway and a lot of organisms that we can manipulate um, have this pathway, so it gets used a fair amount. But there are other carbon fixation pathways. There is a pathway called the reductive TCA cycle, the reductive acetyl-CoA pathway, 3-hydroxypropionate bicycle, the hydroxypropionate hydroxybutyrate cycle, dicarboxylate hydroxybutyrate cycle, um, most of these, um, at least especially the last three, there's not a tremendous amount known about them. They've basically just been discovered. There are a few um, organisms, microorganisms, that have been shown to use these things. Um, but they're not very well studied. The organisms that have these pathways are kind of hard to grow, um, and these pathways can be designed into uh, other organisms, potentially. A, s a minimal carbon fixation cycle has been worked out. Uh, again, this is a very theoretical thing. This has not necessarily been done in, um, in nature. Um, it's g it doesn't have the ability, as you can see. In fact, it's using energy and not providing energy for a cell. But you can see you're using carbon dioxide and um, converting it. It's going into this little uh, four enzyme cyclic pathway here to make um, first succinyl-CoA into alpha-ketoglutarate and then alpha-ketoglutarate then becomes isocitrate uh, with the addition of two carbon dioxide molecules and again you're using a molecule of ATP each time you go through the cycle so it's not necessarily um, it's certainly not natural because any pathway of this type would allow for um, not only carbon fixation but at least a little energy to be taken out of it. Um, and kind of the whole concept of carbon fixation and using it in organisms, in uh, biotechnologically relevant organisms to make new pathways and to make uh, biomolecules using a cheaper carbon source has sort of 
generated a wave of uh, innovation or at least a wave of thinking that maybe we can build a better carbon fixer. So somehow strategize a way towards enhanced carbon fixation to be able to give us a um, biocatalyst that can produce whatever uh, kind of compound we want using carbon dioxide and do it more efficiently. Uh, so we could target, if we're talking photosynthetic organisms, uh, we can target light gathering efficiency. Um, certainly carbon concentrating mechanisms can be used. Things like carboxisomes uh, have been imagined. Carboxylating reactions, so again looking at uh, altering rubisco, although this is a hard thing to do. Um, decreasing oxygen sensitivity, sensitivity of certain enzymes. Um, even electrosynthesis, uh, looking at uh, electrons um, and or organisms like um, Shiwanella and um, Geobacter uh, can be used uh, and can be engineered to potentially be better carbon fixers. So we can redesign already existing carbon fixation pathways. First we do this uh, as an academic exercise and that was the kind of the impetus of that minimal carbon fixation pathway. We can make theoretically make cheap biofuel production more efficient, i.e. make it cheaper, um, and make it more readily able to compete with the current petroleum bio petroleum fuel landscape, um, and also to realize other autotrophic productions, whatever they may be. Um, of course, the pessimist view is this. Nature has had millions of years to perfect uh, carbon fixation here. Um, so it hasn't really done it that much, but you could argue, you could be less of a pessimist and argue, well, we have different goals here. We're not trying to make the organism survive per se in a better way using carbon dioxide. We're just trying to get them to use carbon dioxide to make stuff that we want. Our goal is to manufacture bioproducts, and our bioproduct is uh, biofuels. Okay, so the flipped classroom assignment. So I will will have posted uh, not only the link to this lecture, the slides, um, and all that onto my courses, but I will also post uh, a few papers that you can look look over, uh, examine them. Don't read them cover to cover necessarily, but just kind of look them over, kind of figure out what the salient points are in each of these papers. Um, and then for the flipped class, organize yourselves into groups, discuss uh, what you have read or what you've looked at in the papers in your groups, and answer the questions provided in the exercise here. Uh, and the purpose of this is to help you consider possibilities of biofuel synthesis uh, and how the power of metabolic engineering can affect uh, those possibilities. Okay, so that's all I have. Um, we will see you on Friday uh, with a flipped classroom activity.